Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I've felt uh, a little chagrin that many people uh, describe me as a critic of Adam Smith because of the, the, the way I've tried to pit Darwin against Smith. I, I think my real target in the book is the, the naive modern disciple of Adam Smith. Adam Smith thought that you could turn greedy, selfish people loose in the marketplace and get the government out of the way and you'd get the greatest good for the greatest number just from their uh, pursuit of self-interest alone. Smith, of course, never believed that. If, if you read Theory of Moral Sentiments or his other works and, and even the Wealth of Nations carefully, you'd see he was far more circumspect than that. But uh, realize that the invisible hand narrative for which we, we uh, remember him is a really quite remarkable story all the same. The fact is we often do get socially benign results when selfish people seek their own interests in the marketplace. The, the classic uh, tale of the entrepreneur who introduces a cost-saving innovation, his goal isn't to help society, obviously. He wants to, to just steal market share from his rivals, and if he's able to cut costs significantly, he, he succeeds brilliantly at doing that in the short run. In time, we'll recognize the invisible hand story as an interesting special case of the more general vision of competition that Darwin offered. Here Darwin's key insight was that natural selection molded traits for their capacity to help the individual animal survive and reproduce successfully. Oftentimes the traits that got molded in, in that process were very much uh, uh, in, a, in a, a narrative that, that resembles closely the invisible hand story about cost-saving innovations or product design improvements. But not always. Many traits were selected because they helped individuals, but were quite inimical to the well-being of larger groups to which the individuals belong. And in those cases, when there was a conflict, it would be individual interests that would tend to trump, often to the severe detriment of larger groups. The antlers of the bull elk, uh, why are they so big? They're, in the modern am animal, they span four feet or more. They weigh 40 pounds. They're, they're massive, actually. If, if you think about uh, what it would be like for you if you had something four feet across and 40 pounds attached to your head, uh, it, it would be a, a huge encumbrance. And it is for them as well. If they're chased into wooded areas, uh, they're easily surrounded by wolves and killed. They're not very mobile once they're in, in close quarters. Uh, and so uh, why are their antlers so big? Darwin's account was persuasive. Uh, they're a polygynous species, elk are, like most vertebrates, and what that means is that males take more than one mate if they can. The if they can qualifier is extremely important. Uh, what it means is that some succeed, and, and that implies others don't get any mates at all, which is, of course, the ultimate loser slot in the Darwinian scheme of things. If you don't get a mate, then you don't pass copies of your stuff down into the next round. It's over for you. So a mutation occurs that codes for larger antlers. It spreads like wildfire. Mutations <coughs> accrete, and here we are with four-foot antlers that weigh 40 pounds. If you don't have four-foot antlers, if you have three-feet antlers, you're not going to get a mate. So you got to have big antlers to be a, a, a competitor in this arena. But the fact that you've all got big antlers is completely contrary to your interests as bulls as a group. From the perspective of bulls as a group, they're not interested in the species. That, let's talk about their interests. They'd rather not be surrounded and killed by wolves. That would be a better outcome from their perspective. And if they could, if they could take a vote on the matter, at the count of three, put your hoof down on the red button, all antlers will shrink by half. Because they'd all be more mobile, they'd be less likely to be surrounded and killed by wolves. And in the process, uh, the, the fights that they're engaged in, which are enormously consequential for them, wouldn't be decided any differently. It's relative antler size that matters, not absolute antler size. Most of the animal species he studied couldn't, couldn't muster the cognitive and communication skills to even have any, any hope of implementing a collective action solution 
to a problem like that. But that's, that's the, the response to people who say the invisible hand assures us that all you need to do is get the government out of the way and let markets work their magic. Uh, that would be one thing if individual interests coincided with group interests in almost every case. But it's quite another thing to say that if you recognize that individual and group interests are often squarely in conflict and that when you get the collective out of the way and tell individuals to do what's good for you, you often get things that are quite injurious to the collective. Uh, this is a, a different way of thinking about the role of government. Adam Smith thought you needed government. Uh, mostly he thought you needed government because uh, you needed to protect people against the consequences of actors with market power. If you want to worry about big companies with market power, and I think we do still need to worry about that, the, the domain in which their market power is a threat to our interests now is in the political realm. They will use their resources to buy special favors from governments. So markets do not do everything we want them to do. Uh, they, they do what individuals want to see done, and that's sometimes uh, very much in conflict with what we want to see done as, as a collective. Here's a nice example of, of the conflict between individual and group interests uh, that's due to Tom Schelling. Uh, he was a hockey fan for many decades teaching at Harvard, and what he observed was that if hockey players are left to their own devices, they'll skate without helmets every time. But then they'll vote in a secret ballot for a rule requiring themselves to wear helmets. So if helmets are so great, Schelling asked, why don't you just wear one? Why do you need a rule? If you put a sign up in a hockey player's uh, locker room saying, caution, skating without a helmet might lead to serious injury, do you think they would wear helmets? Is that, is that what leads them not to wear helmets? That was not Schelling's explanation. His explanation was that they face a collective action problem. If I take my helmet off as a, as a player, I gain a slight competitive edge. I can see better, I can hear better, I'm better able to intimidate you because I'm crazy enough to skate without a helmet and willing to risk injury in, in the process. And so the other side's not going to sit idly by while, while our team gets a competitive advantage. They're going to restore the balance by taking their helmets off. And then we're all skating without helmets. There's no competitive edge, and yet we're all subject to greater risk of injury. The solution for that is a helmet rule. It's not a sign in the locker room saying, caution, skating without a helmet is risky. They know that. They know it's risky. They need a rule. It's a collective action problem. It's not because people are stupid. The behavioral economics movement has been mostly about cognitive errors, mistakes people make. That's not what my argument is about. I'm, I'm going to confront the free market conservatives on their own turf. I'm going to grant them all their core assumptions. Markets are perfectly competitive, I'm going to tell them. People are rational. The whole behavioral economics movement has been about the fact that they're not rational, so obviously that's not literally true either, but is it so bad as a, as a, as a working assumption if you're trying to figure out broad outlines? I mean, if you're making terrible mistakes, uh, you have an incentive to figure out how to do better, you can solve that kind of problem on your own in principle. So people are rational, markets are competitive. The only other assumption I add, and this is the one I take from Darwin, is that life's graded on the curve to varying degrees in different domains. It's not how fast you are. It's not how smart you are, how, how strong you are. It's, it's how, how you compare in the traits that matter for the local competition that you're embroiled in. What that means is that, just like in an athletic uh, contest, there are only so many winners, the rest are losers. Uh, anything that makes one party more likely to win makes everyone else more likely to lose. It, there's a zero-sum component to a lot of what we do. It's mutually offsetting. So think about the worker who wants to send his kids to a better school. The better schools, as you all know, are in the more expensive neighborhoods. That's true in every country. And so if you want to send, if you're in the median uh, of the earning, part of the earnings distribution, right in the middle, and you want to send your kids to a, a school of just average quality, one right in the middle of the quality distribution, and, and who wouldn't think Ill, Ill of a parent who didn't have at least that ambitious of a goal for his or her kids, you've got to outbid half of all other families with the same goal for a house in the, the middle of the school quality distribution. And so one thing I can do as a parent, if I don't have enough money to, to, to make that goal, I'll take a riskier job. I'll earn, I'll earn more pay doing that. Or I'll 
draw down my savings uh, in order to, to put together a down payment on a house in a better school district. Or if the banks let me borrow more, I'll do that in order to bid more aggressively for a house in a better school district. Each time we all do that, however, we don't achieve the result we were hoping to achieve. Schools are contextual. What's a good school? It's a school that's better than other schools in the same general area. And so when we all bid more aggressively for a house in a better school district, the only thing that happens at the end of the day is that we've bid up the prices of the houses in the better school districts. If that's the outcome, why not regulate safety? Every country regulates safety. They say they do it to protect workers against exploitation from monopsony employers. That's not the reason. It's to protect us against the consequences of the logic of competition that we're embroiled in amongst ourselves. That's the explanation. That's the only one that parses with the data. And so if you discard this idea that the, the individual actions guide people always to the, the collectively advantageous uh, allocations, then you've got to think fresh about, well, all right, what do we do here? You've got to think about What's the option? Uh, the, the, the government, you want to turn uh, everything over to the government and have them micromanage everything? That, that's an abhorrent vision to me. I, I stress to my students that just because you've shown that a, a market outcome isn't perfect relative to some frictionless ideal, don't assume that means automatically that any old government intervention is going to make matters better. That's, that's uh, you know, we've got lots of examples where governments have intervened and made matters worse. So, so my core recommendation in the book, and I'll quit with this, this is the fiscal alchemy, scrap the income tax. <laughs> Get rid of it. That's, that's always the popular part of the recommendation, uh, but, but there's a but coming. We need revenue. The, the libertarians get on the stump every year and they say all taxation is theft. Uh, what could they be thinking when they say that? Uh, that taxes should be voluntary? Uh, there's no country with voluntary taxes. If you had voluntary taxes, uh, people wouldn't pay them regularly. You'd, you'd, you'd start off paying them maybe, but then you'd see your neighbors not paying them, and you say, well, I'm not paying mine if he's not paying his, and then there'd be no, no tax revenue. You couldn't really support much of a government. There wouldn't be much law enforcement or order. There wouldn't be an army. What would happen? You'd get invaded by a country that had an army paid for by its mandatory taxation, and then you'd pay mandatory taxes to its government. We have to tax something. What should we tax? We should tax the things that we would otherwise do too much of. And here, here's the tax I propose. Scrap the income tax. Instead, replace it with a much, much more steeply progressive tax on consumption. And here's how that would work. You would report your income to the tax authorities, as you do now. Then you'd report how much you saved during the year. The difference between those two numbers, your income minus your savings, that's how much you spent during the year. That's the, that's the computational insight. So we know how much you spent. Then we'll take off a big standard deduction. Let me say 20,000 pounds for a family of four. That's to acknowledge that uh, low-income families spend most of their income and so wouldn't get much of a benefit from a savings exemption. And then you pay tax at a very low rate on the, the resulting number. Income minus savings minus 20,000 pounds. Tax at a very low rate, so your, your tax would be as low or lower as under the current system. But then the rate at the margin on consumption would rise steeply. So what, what would you do if you were a, a wealthy person and thinking about adding another wing onto your mansion at that point, a two million pound addition onto your mansion. You would say, wow, uh, I was planning to spend two million, now it's gonna cost me four million pounds to build that addition. Call the architect, let's scale back. Let's build a one million pound addition. That way we'll end up spending no more than before. And here's the magical step. If we and others like us do that, and that would be the, the uh, forecast uh, reaction to the tax, then the smaller additions to our mansions that we each would build would serve just as well, if not better, than the larger ones we would have built in the absence of that tax. Because beyond some point, as with antlers, it's relative mansion size that matters. This is not rocket science that I'm talking about. I, I'm, I'm starting with the classical model that Adam Smith used. Markets are competitive, people are rational. I'm adding only the uncontroversial assertion that life's graded on the curve to differing degrees in different domains. And when you have those three things together, it follows like night follows the day that you get too much spending in certain areas and not enough in others.
what's very interesting about what you're saying is, is that, of course, we often hear um, Darwinian metaphors and theory applied to the economy, um, but often they're applied particularly by the right. Um, and one argument you hear from those of a libertarian bent is that the benefit of a, a competitive market economy is that the, the strongest, the most fit, are the ones that survive. And those that are, are weak, the firms that can't compete in their environment, are the ones that die. And that, in fact, collective solutions or government intervention interferes with that process and, in fact, only ends up benefiting uh, the weak. So what is, what is it that you think is their misunderstanding of Darwin's theory? What are they getting wrong about Darwin? Uh, a, a lot of people seem to think that Darwin was a social Darwinist. Uh, as I read Darwin, he was not a social Darwinist. Uh, the, the social Darwinists of the late 19th century thought that whatever survives under competition is morally praiseworthy. It's good. We, we should have more of that and less of in everything else. Uh, I, I don't think that can have been the view of a humane man like Darwin evidently was. Uh, if, if you look at what the imperatives of competition are in nature but also in the marketplace, uh, you would not want to think of that as uh, a system that generates morally praiseworthy outcomes. I mean, think about the, the behavior of the alpha lion. I think this is one of the most vivid examples. The, the alpha lion ascends to the leadership of the pride. The very first thing he does is murder all the cubs sired by previous alpha males. That brings the, the females into estrus more quickly and speeds the propagation of his gen genetic material into the next round, but it's, a, it's an utterly brutal process to witness footage of. Uh, Darwin was absolutely aware that uh, the, the imperatives of competition led to many things that were just not, not good for the, the group as a whole. So it's, if, if you want to read Darwin as generating a theory of morality, I think you can do that. Uh, and, and the whole question of morality, uh, in all interesting cases that I can think of, uh, uh, boils down to whether it's okay for an individual to do what he wants to do, given that what he wants to do is going to harm other people. If it's not going to harm anyone, then why shouldn't he be able to do what he wants to do? So it's always a, a question of balancing individual interest against group interest. And uh, One other thing which occurs to me is, uh, and again, it's, it's an objection I can imagine that would be raised uh, from, from the right. And you can imagine someone like, you know, someone like Hayek, an economist like Hayek, saying, you know, you're, you're too sanguine about um, collective solutions, that in effect what you're overlooking is, is that the state is as much a competitive player in the economy and in society as uh, other agencies. And so in effect what you're saying is you've come up with a, a really handy way of giving the government bigger antlers. <laughs> and now they're going to be the ones who will be able to be the, the tough ones who call the shots, um, rather yeah. than this sort of rather optimistic view of how the yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a reasonable concern. I'm quite careful to acknowledge that government's imperfect, uh, and that when you have identified an imperfect market outcome, you've really got to weigh the likely imperfection of the government response to that outcome with the imperfection of the market outcome itself and, and, and use practical grounds for trying to decide which is likely to leave you in a better spot at the end of the day. You have to have a government. Uh, some governments do a pretty good job according to Transparency International. Their citizens think their, their public servants are honest. They deliver good public s services. U.S. ranks pretty low on that scale. I'm guessing it's because we have uh, such a high level of corruption in our campaign finance system. Uh, one of my senators for New York is a champion of 15% income tax rates for hedge fund managers. Does he th think they should be 15% because he thinks that's good public policy? People making four, five, six billion dollars a year should pay 15% income tax instead of the usual 40%? I'm, I'm going to guess the answer is no. Uh, I'm going to guess he's influenced to take that position because he gets so much in the way of campaign contributions from the financial services industry. So I'm, I'm alert to that problem. But look, you, if you want a good government, you have to build a good government. Uh, it's hard to build a good government, but New Zealand's got one, Denmark's got one. There, there are countries that have managed to build good governments and, and saying government's evil, government's the source of all ills in society, that's not the first step in building a good government.